Hey, what's up guys? For those of you that are new, I'm Amanda, and on this channel we talk a lot about bridging the gap between mental and physical health. And today, I have a special guest who's a three-time WCW World Heavyweight Champion, two-time WCW US Heavyweight Champion, four-time WCW Tag Team Champion, as well as a WWE Hall of Famer, author of Positively Page, Positively Unstoppable, and the founder of DDP Yoga. Welcome, Diamond Dallas Page. Thank you so much for being here with us today, having this chat, having this conversation. How is COVID treating you through all this? Well, personally, I've been healthy, so that's that's all that really matters. Um, you know, I'm 64 now, so I don't even want to think about getting uh, a flu that attacks your lungs. And a lot of my lungs are in great condition right now, but my throat, which would be on the way there, uh, is not because I've abused it over the years by just blowing my voice out and just keep on going. I actually lost my voice, not this year, but last year for like six weeks. So uh, I don't want that sit. <laughs> I don't want it. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm uh, respectful when I go out. And a lot of my friends either take it seriously, really seriously, or they don't take it seriously at all. And I'm like, if you don't got to take it seriously at all, I can't even be around you, you know, <laughs> because you, know, you can have your own opinions. And I knew as soon as they started, because you really needed to try to get the country back, you know, get us back to working, period. Um, I knew they were going to do this. When they, when they closed it off, like I got interviewed by um, um, uh, Harvey Levin and Charles from uh, uh, TMZ Sports. I got uh, interviewed by um, uh, Anderson Cooper. And when they heard that I wasn't opening up my DP Yoga Performance Center, my workout studio, um, they were like, wow, you're, 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 uh, you're moving on the side of caution. And like, yeah, because a lot of people who come to my place, a lot of them, they're all different ages, but there's, there's, a, there's a good handful of people who are older and I don't want to be responsible for any of that. I don't even know if I'm going to open that part of my business up again. It's going to be a little bit of madness. And as you know, everyone knows our country. I mean, you talk about mental health right now. Our, our our whole from PTSD to, <laughs> to uh, people who have been in depression. I mean, it's going to hit an all time high. I've heard it already quadrupled. The number of calls that are going into the suicide hotline and whatnot has quadrupled since yeah. this started. I, you know, and it's not being a pessimist, it's a fact. Yeah. Because when you, when you take people away from their work, you know, that gives them a sense of, you know, feeling good about themselves when even if they hate their job, if they put 40 hours in and they get a paycheck and they're, you know, sustaining their life and their family, they, it still makes you feel good. I mean, to me, everything is so screwed up right now. And, and on top of that, the craziest election of all time is coming. A bumbling boob <laughs> is running against a bumbling boob. Now, <laughs> Trump has been, I think Trump's done some good stuff as far as what he's done for the country, but he's such an arrogant SOB that, you know, I just, you know, and I get he's trying to say, I did this and I did that and I did this, but he could say it so much more eloquently. It's, at times, Trump does exactly, says exactly what he wants to say, and it's obvious, and some of it sounds really great, and then he'll just go, I did this and I did that, and I, it's like, shut up. You know, you can, and he could, Trump could really, Trump could really change his entire, his entire stance on, you know, his viewpoint. It would be really hard for the Democrats to bury him if he grabbed people like The Rock, Oprah, LeBron, and then grabbed like Tom Brady and a couple other white people and grabbed a couple of Asian people, a couple of uh, Latinos, put them together and put them all together in a room with him and said, okay, what do we really need to do to fix this? Like, he would be like, they would, couldn't be able to say anything against them. It's mind-boggling to me that he hasn't done it. But all of this we're talking about has everything to do with depression. Yep. Because when, you've get, when you're down, and, you know, I, I've been, you know, I've been down just like everybody else. We're about to release a new uh, documentary. We'll actually just release... If you're watching out there, you want to see the great, one of the greatest documentaries of all time. And it's not because I put, you know, my name on it. Um, 
the resurrection of Jake the Snake really deals with past depression. It deals with addiction, depression, um, shame, emotional gravity. Uh, It'll make you cry. You know, it'll also make you laugh. But most of all, it'll inspire you. It's up on Amazon Prime right now. If you have Amazon Prime, you get to see it for free. Then you'll see really what my life is all about, what my DDPY program is all about. Because the number one thing, I wanted to get Jake working out. I wanted to get him out of his darkness. But before I could do any of that, I had to start feeding him real food which he'd been eating like garbage, you know, fast, fake food for decades, Coke, crack, booze, pills. You clean a guy up and then you feed him real food. Mentally, he's already going to start feeling better about himself. Then when he starts to work out, again, he's going to pull himself down because he's in the worst shape he's ever been ever. And that's going to mentally affect you. But when you start dropping those pounds, like one of the things Jake said to me, because we had, when we started that journey in 2012, we'd done, man, when people found out that I was bringing Jake Roberts, a known addict who had, didn't just burn bridges, he nuclear blew them up, um, that I was bringing him into my home to help him with his addiction, to help him finish his career on his own terms. Uh, And then I brought Scott Hall, a.k.a. Razor Ramon, in. Same thing. I mean, these two guys were on – they were on the top two of the top ten list of next guys to die. Like, they had a whole list all over the Internet. Who are going to be the next ten guys that could die because of ODing or just killing themselves? And Jake and Scott were one and two for years, you know, until they moved in with me. And people couldn't believe that I was moving these two addicts into my home, but I never looked at it like that. Those guys are my blood friends. Without those guys giving me the opportunity and helping guide me early on in my wrestling career, I never have all this. So I was taking my brothers in and saying, okay, let's get our shit together here. And the main thing I'm bringing those guys into my house and anybody who's watching your show needs to watch that movie because it deals with mental health. It deals with understanding. You mentioned earlier that I wrote a book called Positively Unstoppable, The Art of Owning It. What I got Scott and Jake to do is understand that you are the story you tell yourself. You know, if you say you can't or you say you can, you're right. I really got them to understand you are the story you tell yourself, good or bad. It's super interesting that you say that because there's a little bit that I didn't tell you. I reached out to you a couple years ago back in the end of 2018. We were conversating over text and I told you that I was struggling mentally, but I didn't really go into detail about how severe that was. But when I reached out to you, I had nearly taken my life a few days before that. I was on a ledge in a Canadian hotel room, hit rock bottom, mentally had absolutely nothing left. And I texted you just pretty much like, give me some insight here. I don't know what to do. I don't know what the next step is. And I will never forget what you said, because if anyone else would have said it to me, I would have wanted to punch them in the face. But you being you and me knowing I a, probably would have got my ass kicked and you kind of have that that fatherly advice in, in a way because um, I connect uh, to my dad through you. But you said, you know, you've got yourself into this mess. It's on you to get yourself out of it. And if I heard that from most people, I probably would have felt patronized and annoyed and, well, you don't fucking get me. And I would have gotten very aggressive about it. But from you, it gave me what I needed to hear. It was that step into my power to say, you're right. I did make these choices to have an unhealthy lifestyle that led into cocaine addiction, that led into you know these mental health issues that had culminated on a hotel ledge where I almost killed myself. All these problems, a lot of them were choices that I had made to myself. So thank you so much for you know having given me that insight at that time that it was on me to take back my power and kick ass. Yeah, it's on everyone, you know, and 
there is no magic pill. Now, can Prozac help some people? Yes, because they need it. The repetitions of affirmations leads to belief. And once that belief becomes like a deep conviction, things begin to happen. So before I walked out for my Hall of Fame, to get my Hall of Fame ring, uh, 2017 Orlando, Florida, WWE Hall of Fame, before I walked out there, I could have been thinking, oh man, I haven't been on stage in 15 years. I haven't spoken in front of 20,000 people in 15 years. I haven't talked to the millions of people watching me on TV. What if I fail? What if I, what if I freeze? What if, what if, what if I knew my success was a certainty? What if I knew failure was not an option? You see, the only voice inside my head before I walked out on that stage Eric Bischoff, you did your show just a week or so ago. Uh, one of my best friends throughout my wrestling career. No one knew my career better than he did except for Dusty Rhodes. And Dusty Rhodes was no longer with us. I've got my four daughters with me. I'm about to walk out there. The only voice in my head is this. This is going to be my greatest moment in professional wrestling. I am going to blow everyone away. I'm going to make them laugh. I'm going to make them cry. I'm going to inspire them. That's the only voice in my head, period. And when I went out there, I did what I, you know, if people say, what's your favorite moment in professional wrestling? That moment. Because I nailed a 27 minute speech and the people in the palm of my hand. It was unbelievable, but it was all because of the story I tell yourself. The repetitions of affirmations leads to belief, good or bad. The repetitions of affirmations, when they are good, they will make you believe. Repetitions of affirmations leads to belief. And once that belief becomes a deep conviction, things begin to happen. Ali, when he went down, you know, when he, when he passed away, he went down as the greatest of all time. Like, that's what people call him, the greatest. And why? Because he said it a million times. He actually believed it. He was saying since he was a kid. So that's the biggest reason. So if you have to take Prozac or whatever mental drug you need to take to help you get through the day, it still comes down to the story you tell yourself, period. Yeah, and I think that everybody focuses so much on the physical aspects of everything, the physical aspects of wrestling, the physical aspects of fitness, the physical aspects of all these things, but the mental aspects kind of get tossed to the side and we forget the importance of what we tell ourselves. We forget the importance of what we're letting into our brain. And even with wrestling, you know, everybody knows, you go out there, you took a beating every night, but nobody's thinking, hey, he's having to travel every day for months and months and months upon end. He has to hold this persona all the time that had to have in itself been taxing minus the the physical aspects and i feel like the only time we ever talked about mental health and wrestling at least as far as i remember was when the the chris Benoit tragedy happened everybody talked about it for a hot minute and then everybody shut it down and we couldn't talk about it anymore so there was no real connection of the mental health health aspect but there was a, a pretty intense tax mentally in in the industry yeah a hundred percent. So you wear, when you wear and tear your body down, your body is a part of your whole, you know, your brain's a part of your body. I say that so all the time. <laughs> you know, when you're working so hard and like, you know, I might be on the road back, back in the day for the eighties when all those guys would later die in the eighties and nineties, I mean, in the 80s, they might work 90 straight days with a two-a-day on Saturday and Sunday. I mean, at 2 o'clock, they wrestle in um, in Fort Myers, Florida, and then at 7 o'clock, they wrestle in Tampa or Miami, 300 miles away, 120, you know, 100, I guess 160 miles away, uh, and then hop on a plane and fly somewhere else to do Raw. Uh, it, this, the schedule's brutal. So when your body gets beat up and you can't fake gravity, so the, that's why I tell people exercise, the greatest thing you can do for your body. After, you know, and a lot of people think, oh my God, 
DDP, I can't do your stuff. It'll kill me. It'll kill you. You obviously never, you never looked at my DDPY program because our workouts start at 10 minutes and they're in bed. They're called bed flex. We got three of them. They built the 12 minutes. Then you go to the chair and chair force where you're sitting in a chair working out. Those workouts start at 15 minutes and build to 22 minutes. Then it goes to stand strong where you're using a chair. You don't even get the beginner unless you want to try and start there. So you can't tell me, you know, that our stuff's too challenging. A lot of people like just to complain. And that's where it gets really dark. And you've got to like pull yourself out of the hole. Well, I think that's a point too, is a lot of people, it's not necessarily laziness or that they don't want to take that step. They have that fear blocking them. They want to be positively unstoppable, but they, they're, they're stuck. They're blocked. What's your advice for those people that want to take that first step, but just don't really know what to do? And by the way, guys, I'm going to link all of the DDPY programs below so you guys can check that out. Um, there's three words. Nike made a bazillion dollars on them. Just do it. You know, I'm afraid I'm going to fail. Yeah, you fail if you never start. Or you fail if you quit. You don't fail if you're doing. Because then you're on the road to recovery. So you have to get up and get on the mat. You know, or on your rug. You know, <laughs> Well, it's too much trouble. You're right. Again, I don't even try to, I don't try to convince anybody anything. If you're someone who's 450 pounds, you have a mental problem with food because you didn't just gain that weight. You had to be eating it. I've deal with guys who are 600 pounds. And if they're putting the work in, they have my attention. If they're not, they don't. Because I don't have the time to go, dude, what are you doing? Come on, get back on track. You know, I'll try to inspire them a little bit. But like, there's so many people who come to my, you know, will, will ask me for help, but they'll take the hour to write some long bring in uh, post on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram that, uh, you know, if they're writing me, why they can't find the time. I know that just took you an hour plus to write that. If you're a great writer, you know, if you're not, it probably took two hours and you took two hours there. So it's all about like, what do you want? You know, in this, uh, in this book, Positively Unstoppable, The Art of Owning It. It is whatever you want it to be. And it teaches you how to reprogram your brain. The first paragraph, Ask the question, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you do if you knew your success was guaranteed? Because I've got one story after another that isn't my story. I use my story in as well, but I use all the people I work with. And their stories are fascinating, you know, but every single one of them it comes down to work. Inside my Hall of Fame ring, it says work ethic equals dreams, explanation point, DDP. I know when you were breaking in to the industry, you kind of came in at a later age than most people. And at first, you were willing to kind of settle for being a manager until it seemed like overnight, you're like, nope, I'm going to be a wrestler. Was there some kind of shift there that happened? Like what mentally shifted to make you go from, okay, I'm going to settle for being less than what I want to be to, nope, I'm going for my dream and screw everyone that doesn't believe in me. This is the guy I looked like then. <laughs> so I remember that hair. I love that hair. You know, between the, the hair and the clothes and the bling and the diamond dolls and your rap, like, and Scott Hall told me all the time, he's like, Dally, you're, you're, you're you're too over the top. You're taking attention away from what we're doing out there. And what Magna basically told me is that that Diamond Dallas page, as a manager, was too over the top for professional wrestling. But as a wrestler, he wouldn't be. And he said, man, we should have let you put on a pair of tights and boots in the beginning and see if you could do this. And he kind of laughed. 
and walked away. He wasn't laughing at me. Just, he knew how hard that would have been. I was 35 and a half. And I had seven months left to my contract. And I thought, you know what? I never got in this business because I tried to wrestle when I was 23. I had three matches. On the third match, I got thrown over the top rope and I torqued my right knee really bad. And it put me out for a couple of months. And that was in, I wrestled, I tried to wrestle in 79. And then around the early 80s, like 82 in the Northeast, the WWF started blowing up big time. And I, I hear everybody talking about it. And I was so mad that I didn't pay my dues. I stopped watching wrestling. And I would, you know, I would uh, be pulled back in when I saw Jesse Ventura on TV. And he was so over the top. And um, the first match that came out, a guy had a, a bag over his shoulder and he looked like a badass dude. It was Jake Stake Roberts. And I was like, who is this guy? And uh, I got sucked in by Jake. That Magnum basically said, it's not, I go, Magnum, what did I do wrong? He's like, D, it's not your fault. You know, we should have put you in a pair of tights and boots to see if you could do this. Like there you would be right on point. And, uh, so at 35 and a half, I went down to power plant and I started training and they beat the hell out of me and they beat the hell out of everybody who comes in mainly because if you can't take that, 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 um, initiation, you sure as hell can't make it on the road, you know? So, and everybody, anybody sees another guy come in, they think they're trying to take their spot. So there's only so many spots that I actually made it from nothing to one of the top guys in the world is like, it proves that work ethic equals dreams, you know? And that's what, if people can't understand that, uh, so many people can have such an amazing life if they just put the work in. It's really not that hard. It's more about um, discipline, and showing up every day, you know, and just being consistent. That's what it's really about. It's how I've been able to, it took me eight years in wrestling to be an overnight sensation. And that's what it was like. 19, in, in 1996, at the end of the year, everybody was looking at me like, wow, this guy's on fire. And then I got in that feud with Savage and my career went to the moon. In 1997, I was the hottest wrestler. Oh, we have in the it. World. I remember. Yeah, I was. I was the hottest wrestler in the world. Me and Stone Cold Steve Austin. We were the two guys. Yep. And Steve was nine years younger than me. I was 41. Steve was uh, uh, 32 or 33. And uh, we were best friends over that, you know, from the beginning when we originally got together. But. For DDP Yoga, it it was a it was a longer journey. But when I started to make it a business uh, 16 years ago, like it took eight years and five hundred and forty eight thousand dollars before I took a dime out of my company. So you want to talk about depression? You want to talk about emotional gravity pulling myself down? You know, like you're a hundred, two hundred, up around four hundred thousand dollars in, and it's not looking like it's going to happen. Like you can really beat yourself up about that. It so comes down to the story you tell yourself. And right when I would start to get being pulled down emotionally, I might get an email from somebody who got my workouts and how it changed their life and how they can now play with their kids. You know, we have all these amazing videos of people losing upwards of 300 pounds in like 18 months. You know, it's like crazy. This is not a weight loss program. That's just an awesome side effect. This is about making your body feel amazing, making your body be unstoppable, holding back the hands of time. That's what DDPY is all about. The weight. Yeah, that's an awesome side effect. 
but we have so many people you know, because of their weight or because they're beat up have trouble playing with their kids you know and then when all of a sudden you give that back to them man that's rewarding so i get on the mat again exercise relieves stress so i get on the mat 20 30 40 minutes later i feel great and i'm unstoppable again i head off and you know again the story you tell yourself i keep telling myself you know when it comes to emotional gravity depression whatever you want to call it the rock did a thing and it got mazillions but everything the rock does gets mazillions of views but he talked about depression being really bad and how old he had you know his, his production company is called seven bucks because that's all the money he had left in his pocket seven bucks uh when things started to turn around for him and uh you know he went down you know and if you talk to trump or oprah or obama or tom brady or ha tom hanks for that matter every one of these monster stars every single one of them whoo, goes down and gets depressed the key is they don't stay there they whoo, and they come back up again everything will come down to the story they tell themselves and once you stop the pity part party or stop saying i can't your whole life changes if you have to say i can't Say, I can't do it yet. So is that the biggest difference really between DDP now, like DDP Yoga Dallas versus the Dallas 97 Halloween Havoc versus Randy Savage Dallas? Is there advice that you would have given that Dallas to better handle stress or mental health? Because I feel like this is something you've learned in the process. Well, at that point, I didn't even tell me anything because people said, what, what, if you weren't wrestling now, what would you be doing? I said, anything I want. I mean, I was so mentally strong over that period. Now, if you'd asked me when I was in the WWF at the time and doing the stalker angle, I don't think I would have had that confidence because that was like the worst booking to ever happen to me. And it just, me and Mark, we didn't jive the way we should have. Plus, you know, I, I don't think I was as good as I, as I, as I was just a year before. Um, I could have been if it was people's champ versus people's champ, because I would have been electrified, but you know, it was, it taught me so many things like that whole process. Remember the story you tell yourself, like people would say to me, what do you think about Vince McMahon trying to ruin your career? I'd be like, what, what are you talking about? These are interviewers trying to get me to like say stupid stuff, you know, like be bitter. You know, after I love, like, first of all, Mitch McMahon gave me a huge opportunity. Now, is it is the opportunity I should have taken? No. What I should have done, and this is what I learned from Vince, what I should have done was I should have gotten up and said, Vince, thank you so much for the opportunity. But when you want to do people's champion versus people's champion, give me a call and walked away from the table. When you know you have something super valuable, you have to have the mental power and belief in yourself to say, mm, that doesn't work for me. Now, I never really did a lot of that before that day uh, when Vince and I met on Memorial Day weekend, it was. And I learned a very valuable lesson from that, from him. Now. It has made me the businessman I am today because there is a large number of times where people have come to me before it had happened, before it had made it, before the company took off and since the company's taken off. Um, they wanted to get involved. They wanted to invest money. They believe, well, no, uh, no. I, some, some people I've thought about too, like, nope, I'm not going to do it because I believed in myself. I only bet on myself. Again, you gotta, you gotta, there's a positive in everything. You know, there's a positive in everything. If you, if, you, if you could constantly look for the negatives, I guarantee you find them. Yeah. You know, it's I'm very grateful. Bias. Yeah, I'm very grateful to, to Vince and Triple H and Stephanie and Shane McMahon because they gave me, uh, 
you know, the last seven years, you know, I don't work with them now because of AEW, that's only because it's Cody. If it wasn't Cody Rhodes, there is no way that I'd be working with any other company but WWE. But when Cody made this miracle happen, AEW, I, I and he's like my nephew, you know. Without Dusty Rhodes, there is no Diamond Dallas Page. So it's not like, you know, I don't want to be part of WWE because I do. You know, I still think they're, you know, great. You know, I think WWE, you know, I got a lot of good friends there. And, uh, you know, I wish them all the luck in the world. And right now, you know, it's just a really hard time because there's no fans there. And that's, you know, that's kind of crazy because wrestling is all about the fans. So, and that's what this whole COVID thing, that's why we're nowhere near out of the woods. And there's going to be a lot of people you know, if they don't grab a hold of the story to tell themselves, you know, and just try to try to work on their mental health, it's going to get, you know, it's going to get darker before it gets lighter. Yeah, and coming up on COVID, like with this second wave probably about to hit, especially with 4th of July weekend, I guess we can kind of close on that. I feel like a lot of people are struggling right now to find, you know, that balance between self-care as far as, okay, I'm going to take a day off and okay, I need to go run or go do whatever. And I mean, nutrition's a little tricky in some places because food might not be as available. It might be harder for people during this time. I know I've, I've definitely faltered a few times myself on a few days, but what is your advice when you're in that high stress uh, situation, be it from COVID or from travel or from a demanding job, what's your advice for sticking with the nutrition aspect of the lifestyle. Oh, you have to really believe in it. That's the whole thing. You know, like I do because I live it, you know, you know, if you're eating shit, you're going to feel like shit. <laughs> it doesn't take, you know, a, a brain surgeon to understand that. You know, you know, if you put negative thoughts in your brain, you're going to, your brain's the greatest magnet ever. The only problem is when you're putting negative shit in there, it's going to suck all that negativity up if you let it. That's why I wake up every morning with an amazing positive attitude. And I work at that every day. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, so... You know, bottom line is, is that, you know, you, you've got to just try to work on, you, have, you can even fake it till you make it. Surround yourself with positive videos, positive movies. You know, it's not like I'm positive, I'm positive, I'm positive. It's just like you become the five people you hang out most with. You know, your friends will pick you up, your friends will pull you down. You know, no one's allowed to be around me was a negative attitude. I'll go, I've gone in to try to help people with that. But if they don't come around, I'm like, next, I don't have time for that. You know, life's too short. So, you know, the bottom line is fill your brain with positive. That's why on our GDP Yoga Now app, I put friggin', you know, friggin' Motivational Monday every Monday. There's 300 of them up there. You know, go and watch one after another. They're all amazing. And it's either stories I've been through, stories I've shared, or, or stories I've found from other people that were amazing. I think Say that's again. a really good place to end because I think that people just kind of have the tendency to think one day they're going to wake up and they're going to be positive, they're going to be happy, and they're going to be healthy. And it's a, it's a chore. You know, you do have to work at it day in and day out. So I, I think that's a really good place to end. Guys, I'm going to link below the DDPY program, Dallas's books, the the – a podcast we've talked about and stuff so you guys can check that out super motivational make sure to give this video a thumbs up subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like this more interviews and let us know in the comments below how you are going to be positively unstoppable today dallas can we get a bang see you now do your ddpy and i know you teach it so you do i do or else bang bang